Yay, you did well. Thank you. Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome. The, um, cool, here we go. I like it when you can see what's on the screen behind you here. Okay, um, the, actually, before we, we do start, can I get everybody just to stand up for a moment? Okay. Um, what I want you to do is just go like this. Okay. It's, it's almost like being a Superman type pose. Okay, we're going to do it once more. You ready? Oh, perfect. Okay. I'll explain why we just did that in a moment, but have a seat. You, you did well. Um, okay. Um, I, I wanted to start this off and say that, you know, good, good afternoon. My name's Ken and I'm an alcoholic. And, um, and I, <laughs> but I, I mean, I suppose after last night, I mean, it's, it's probably quite reasonable. Um, I don't know if you can read this slide from the back, but it, it's, it actually says, um, Ken has been a science teacher for 25 years. He has easy access to chemicals. For the past nine years, he's been adding dihydrogen monoxide to his morning coffee. Ken is now addicted. Without DHMO, he will die in three days. He continues to teach. Now, I, I talk about dihydrogen monoxide normally around the 1st of April, and I actually was showing this to my Year 9 classes this year, and even after explaining that dihydrogen monoxide was water, one girl in the class read it and said, ah, oh, that's why you're always so calm and you never yell at us. And I thought it was really sweet. Um, but it just shows that the things. Um, to tell you a bit about myself, I'm actually a um, Maroon supporter. I, I, I go for, um, for Queensland, hence the, the shirt. And I thought I'd wear that because I know there's so many people from Brisbane and Bronco supporters that I'd probably feel a bit safer if I had it. Okay. It's the football. <laughs> um, look, I, I used to talk about engaging kids in science, and I always used to think, I mean, that was the, the buzzword, you know, two years ago. Um, I now think that, you know, it's, re it's the responsibility of, of us to, to educate students, and in that process, you always hope that there's some kid in your class that you'll actually inspire. And when you get to my age, you actually start to to meet a lot of old students. And every once in a while, one will come back and say, oh, look, I remember when this happened, or, you know, so they've got fond memories. Um, but you've got to wait till you've been teaching for a long, 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 long time for these kids to turn up. This actually took a lot of money to make, and I'll come back. Science teaching is a buzz. Some people, when they get to my age, they, they join clubs and they, they build model trains. But I love teaching science. I get paid for a great hobby. We're lucky we've got a terrific school, terrific teachers and terrific students. And we enjoy teaching science. I actually came here in 2000. The big achievement in the last 15 years is from going from a very... This is embarrassing. Can you see the same shirt? Science ...for year 11 to year oh. 12, to now having over two-thirds of our students choosing to pick science at post-compulsory levels. In our classes, a lot of hands-on activities, which are open-ended, so we're not looking at the recipe type experiment where, where we know what the answer is. That actually gives them the, the chance to actually be in charge of their learning. We get them to write business proposals, make video clips, whatever we can do that extends a student and gives them the opportunity to do what they want to do. Forensic science is one of these great things that, that kids love. So we have a, a crime scene and we'll get students to actually investigate. Space science is very powerful in the, in the classroom. When students come in year seven, they either want to blow things up or they're interested in dinosaurs and they're interested in space. The dinosaurs are all dead, but they can all see themselves as being an astronaut. With space science, um, we also have the opportunity for students to go to the US Space Academy program 
which is excellent for students because they've got six days of intensive learning about space and what it's like to be an astronaut. And then they come back and you see them lift up in what they do in science in, in the class. It's almost like the maturity level's just gone up a notch. This is a, a super exciting time to be teaching science. Now we've got an Australian curriculum and a big emphasis now on the role of having science trained students. I'm very proud of the, the achievement of our school in getting so many students to, to choose science for Year 11 and Year 12. It shows that what we're doing in the junior school is working. Okay, that must have cost an absolute mint to make. It took so long. Um, just that folding of the arms was about half an hour. And then you know, doing things with, with questions there. But one of the things is when you, when you think about people that give up their holidays, I'm sure there's somebody in this room that is eligible to actually get the Prime Minister's Award. Okay, it's, it's closed for this year, but um, if you do good stuff in your classroom, get someone to nominate you, or if you know someone that's doing good stuff, nominate them, because one of the problems that we have um, as teachers is we seldom put our hands up to say that, that we're any good, and we do lots of good stuff. So um, please do that. If, um, if you are interested in that little bit about taking kids to the um, space camp, um, the New South Wales school holidays, it's open to any student, any teacher, in Australia. Um, so if you've got you know, maybe one or two kids in your school that are switched on to, to science, um, just have a look at the website. If I get a bit of chance later, I'll actually um, give more of a promo for it. But we've actually got this year 34 girls and 13 boys going from mainly New South Wales, but also from Queensland, Victoria and South Australia. Okay, um, now this is the theme is Einstein now. Um, Einstein, born 1879, died 1955, um, to a Jewish family. Probably not a nice time of, the, of you know, life to actually be born to a Jewish family. Um, but he won the Nobel Prize in 1921. Um, but people don't realise he actually wanted to be a school teacher. That's, that's what he wanted to do, but he, he actually never went into teaching. There. But towards the end, um, very famous, almost rock star status, um, pointing to his, I don't know whether he's pointing to his brain or to his eyes, the, the only thing that's left over from Einstein is actually his brain, um, that's been pickled somewhere, and his eyes, the guy that actually did the autopsy, took his eyes out, and they're actually in America in a safe deposit box. Why you'd want to keep his eyes for, I don't know, but, um, but they did. The one thing, though, is um, if you look at that picture, can I just point out which finger he's using Okay, to, to point? Um, this is a problem when you have photos taken and they get pixelated. This was the newspaper article that was written about me. <laughs> and um, um, for the Einstein lecture, and... As much as I would try and convince my students, they saw the wrong finger. Uh, um, but look, um, Einstein was a, a pretty photogenic kid. Um, this is him, very, very young there. Very, um, you know, here he is, debonair, hand in pocket, should have a probably you know, cigarette in his mouth. Um, very um, male-dominated time. Um, you'll see this is the photo he's in there. There is actually a lady in there somewhere there. Um, she snuck into the photo. Um, but uh, things were different. And part of this talk, I will talk about things back in history being really different to what they are now. Um, that was um, Einstein with his second wife, Eliza, um, who was actually his cousin. And um, you know, things were different back then that was um, sort of accepted. Um, and quite a lot of people actually did it um, because you knew your cousin. That was quite good. Um, <laughs> Uh, Charlie Chaplin wanted to be him, you know, rock star status here. Um, he did some things like riding bikes around the place, so uh, did, did the normal thing. Okay, um, I'm going to do something on memory. Um, 
I've actually got a perfect um, photographic memory, which is, which is really awful because my recall's not too good, but um, I just need one volunteer. One volunteer from the audience. Thank you. Can you stand up? What's your first name? Annie? Thank you. Um, your job is to just not stay awake, but I need you to keep your eyes open for me. Um, everybody else, I'm going to get you to, um, and this might be really dangerous you know, after lunch, um, I want you to just close your eyes and relax. And I'm going to ask you um, three questions. Okay, just relax. Your job is to stay awake so that, because some people don't like having their eyes closed in public and they might think I'm going to go around and take their photo or hit them on the back of the head. So you're, that's why your eyes are open. Okay, the first question, I want you to think about your favourite food. Okay, so your favourite food. Okay, second question. I want you to think about the place you'd most like to be. And the third question is, in that place, who would you like to have with you? Okay, eyes open. Oh, hopefully we'll get... Oops, sorry. Um, the, the answer to the first question, favourite food? Pasta? Cabanara? Pizza? Favourite food? Okay. Sausages? Yep, favourite food? Okay. You're, you're, you're lucky if you sit at the back because I don't point to you if you're at the back because it's a little bit crooked. Um, but I guarantee no one in the room, when they closed their eyes, saw the word pizza or sausages. So if it was your favourite food, you would have seen it as a picture. And if you were nice and relaxed, you might even be able to smell it and you'd also start to, to salivate. But you, you think about it, when we do things with kids in school, how often do we get them to do lots and lots of writing? So my, my emphasis at the moment is um, we've got to get kids to do writing in their books because that's a skill. They, they need to be able to write. They need to be able to record things. Their parents want to see that they've got stuff in their books. But... They remember things by pictures and by the experience. So if they feel good, you know, if they come into your classroom and you've got some music going, um, they feel really good. Okay. Now, just um, one quote. I'm sure this is true. Don't believe everything on the internet. Um, that was also by Albert Einstein. Um, okay. Um, now, my students told me that every time I tell a story, someone dies. So I'm going to show you a, um, a, a video clip. Um, uh, shark attack. Um, if, if you don't like pe seeing people being chewed up by sharks, just don't look for the moment. Here we go. He's just putting on the GoPro. It does the high five. It's very important. Now, you do expect, if his friends are there, and he's in the water, they're going to yell out shark anyway. Oh, here it is.
Oh, he didn't die. Holy shit. Ooh. Ooh. Um, put up your hand if you think that was true. Okay. Um, put up your hand if you think it was not true. Oh, we've got lots of people. Put up your hands if you don't know. Okay, I don't know, but it's really good to actually show that to students and actually get them to actually... I mean, they, they, they debate very strongly as to whether it was true or not. Um, I wouldn't have a clue, but that discussion as to the fact that stuff on the internet sometimes isn't actually true. Um, but what I, I thought was really nice was that high five that he, he actually gave. Um, you would have seen that first video clip, students leaving our classroom doing the high five on the wall. Now, um, if there's one thing which I've, it's... Oh, sorry, you can sit down. Oh, you've been so, so good. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm glad I saw you because you know, it would be 7 o'clock tonight and we'll be outside having drinks and you'd still be standing there. Um, but um, it's really good to have this sign just beside your door so that as students leave the class... If they've learnt something, they give it a high five. And that way they actually are telling you that, yep, I've learnt something. So it's like you guys giving a clap, okay? Um, kids in your class normally don't clap, but they, on their way out, if they give it a high five, they think, yep, I've learnt something. So the teacher gets a positive. The students actually reinforce the fact that they've actually learnt something, and it reinforces the fact that they're in the classroom to learn. So um, if you like, I can actually just send you that the copy of this is a PDF, but, um, but it's quite cool. Okay, electricity. Um, oh, this is another thing about people dying. We've, we all know about you know, opposites attract and things like that. But um, if you see a guy like this with this hairstyle, especially if you're on the beach, um, just go away from him because the chances are they're about to get zapped and, um, and it wouldn't be really nice. Um, but when we talk about static electricity, we probably talk about... Um, Benjamin Franklin, you know, his classic experiment, well, which some people say that he didn't do, but um, you know, back in 1752, um, flying his, his kite and apparently getting sparks to jump from the key to his fingers. Um, lots of people in history have actually tried to duplicate that and they've been killed um, because of the spark actually is, is more than a spark and goes straight to their head. Um, but look, there's Benjamin Franklin, um, pretty smart guy, really good statesman. Um, classic photo, or classic photo, classic picture of him there. He's got some Year Seven students in the back. Um, <laughs> okay, um, and here's a, a, a classic quote that he had: "In wine there is wisdom, in beer there is freedom, in water is, there is bacteria." Um, yeah, he didn't say that. You're right. Um, but there's, there's actually a movement that each year there's a competition of to invent a quote for Benjamin Franklin. Um, so he, he actually was a, a joker because for the um, Declaration of Independence, they didn't allow him to write the brief because they thought that he would have put a joke in it. Um, so he was, he was quite funny. Um, this is a joke I'm going to tell you about um, because um, I can tell a science joke and you, you all will probably know. Um, but... Could you imagine um, in the foyer of one of the local hotels this sign? Um, electrons and children are not permitted in the bar area. Okay. Electron goes up to the bar, goes to order a beer, and the barman looks at him and said, Sorry, see the sign there? I can't serve you. Um, electrons, you're not allowed in here. So the electron walks off, very negative experience. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm happy some people laughed with that one. Then the, the proton goes up to the bar and the proton leans up against the bar and the barman says, look, I'm sick of you electrons. Go away. And the, the proton goes, but I'm not. I'm a proton. And the barman stares at him and says, are you sure? And he said, yep, I'm positive. <laughs> then, then a neutron goes up to the bar, orders a lemon squash, Barman goes and gets it, and the neutron goes to get his wallet out of his back pocket, and the barman goes, hold on, you're a neutron. 
no charge. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I have to apologise for that. Um, but I thought I would try that. Um, the light globe. Um, if you read books, especially if you're American, they always say it was Thomas Edison that invented it. Um, he didn't. He actually perfected it. He did a lot of research on it. Um, but um, there was a big battle about ACDC. Um, the, um, this is me showing my age, but ACDC, um, I used to wear clothes like that. Um, probably some people did. Um, but there's this big, uh, there was a big battle against ACDC. I'm going to show you a, a clip. Um, th this guy actually does a few, ones, a few good clips on um, electricity. Here's the basic electric guitar I made with four strings. We can add more strings if you want to. Strings are just wires stretched over a piece of wood, tied to nails on each end. The wires at this end are tied together in pairs, as you can see, and each pair is attached to one of these cables, which we can plug them into the wall power plug. <laughs> this is good for year nine on a Friday afternoon. isolated, you are not completely AC isolated, as there is still some capacitance between your body and ground. In some cases, due to the shock and the pain, your body can react fast. <laughs> if you touch the live and neutral wires both, it's very dangerous because the circuit closes through your body. Your muscles can contract this allowing you to let go. If the current goes through your vital organs, like your heart or peanut um, brain, you will very likely meet your maker. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher? The funny thing is that they use electricity to save a cardiac arrest victim. Clear! If you are barefoot and touch the live wire, the current can again go through your body to ground and kill you. It can also contract your leg muscles and make you jump. <laughs> it's a pity though. I thought I could share my artistic side with you. <laughs> I forgot to unplug the damn thing. It definitely made me behave like a rock star though. Makes me think of the similarities. Okay, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll stop it there. Now, you guys are just like year nine because you always laugh when someone gets hurt. <laughs> it's, um, um, this was the first um, design of a light bulb and that was when they actually had enough um, technology to actually pump out the air and, um, and good glass blowers. Didn't work for very long, but this was what they were selling um, and why they was trying to sell electricity. And then, um, this is why there was this great big battle between Edison, so you've got Edison there, um, we should actually boo Edison, I don't think he was a nice person, and Westinghouse, who was a wonderful person. Um, um, yeah, um, well actually Tesla, Tesla um, did so many good things, um, it was, and it was just so far advanced. Um, Edison actually got him to, to do a, a, a pro. He actually had this competition to design an electric motor, or I think it was or a generator, and um, Tesla won it. And then Edison stole the idea, and Tesla said, "Look, you know, you're going to pay me this, you know, which was like a million dollars." And Edison basically said, "No, look, um, 
where in America, I actually didn't think anybody would do it. Um, so I'm not paying. But um, eventually he, he started to work for Westinghouse. And, um, but Edison, um, I almost say he was a, a, basically a, a pig of a man because he, he did um, lots of really nasty things. Um, classic uh, thing that he did do, I, I'll tell you back then, um, this would have been around the 1890s, they, they stopped doing hanging um, for, for people because it got really messy. Um, and there was a lot of science in that. But a dentist noticed that uh, a hobo being electrocuted and then decided, wow, this is a good way that we can actually um, get rid of all of our murderers. You know, so capital punishment, punishment. And Westinghouse actually paid for the first guy, William Kemmler, I think it was, um, for when he actually was um, sentenced to death, paid for the appeal, and it was lost. Now, um, Edison, back in those days, because of, you know, it was press, like newspapers did all of the, all of the communication, um, he actually was paying people, if ever someone got electrocuted, he would pay people to say that they'd actually been Westinghouse. Um, because he was selling DC electricity and Westinghouse was doing AC. Um, the, um, I'll just read the, the quote, William Kemmler. That's not William Kemmler, but it was a picture I found on the, on the internet. He's, his last words were, Well, gentlemen, I wish everyone good luck in this world, and I think I'm going to a good place. And the papers have been saying a lot of stuff that isn't so. That's all I have to say. Now, um, they had three doctors there to actually witness the execution. They had his, um, these bands, like with sponges in, dipped in, in salt water, flicked the switch, he went into convulsions, they turned off the switch. Um, one of the doctors then looked at him and said, you know, by the, the swelling on his nose and the colour, discoloration, I pronounce him dead. He wasn't dead. Um, there was actually a bit of blood that was coming out from his, his wrist and then he started to, to gasp for air and that was, that was, they were there thinking, oh, this isn't good. So they re-soaked the sponges, redid it again, flicked the switch and they didn't stop until they could smell that he was actually cooking. And, um, and you think, you know, that's what happened back in those days and it wasn't really that far, you know, 1890, uh, yep, most definitely. You've, you've, um, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Uh, the, you can actually do that. Um, the story behind this was um, this elephant, whose name was Topsy, um, was working for um, Luna Park in Coney Island and had killed two people. And during the, and because it killed you know, its trainer, they thought, it's killed someone, let's charge it with murder. So they charged it with murder, they had a court case. Um, I don't know who would have defended it, but they found it was guilty. So what do you do to an elephant that's guilty? You have to kill it. So they thought, we're going to build the world's largest gallows to, to kill it. And the ASPCA said, no, you can't do that because we don't even do it for humans anymore. So they tried to poison it and along came Edison and Edison, um, as, as you said, um, actually electrocuted him. And um, if, you, if you Google Topsy and Edison, um, then you'll actually, you can see that the footage, um, yeah, Probably not really worthwhile watching, but, um, but it is there. Okay. Um, terminal velocity. There's actually a good video clip of uh, an old lady jumping out of a plane and losing her false teeth. Um, kids really love that. But for us, terminal velocity, um, for our body size, we don't get anywhere more than 200 kilometres per hour. Okay, which is it's pretty fast. And so if you suddenly, if you're going at 200 kilometres per hour, um, that's not going to kill you, but if you hit something when you stop, that does. Um, okay. Um, there's also this classic um, Apollo um, film clip, so you can see them dropping the, 
the anvil, oh, sorry, the, the hammer and the feather. Um, and it's really good just to show the kids. But, talk, oh, sorry, you're not going to watch that. Um, humans, we actually fall at 200 kilometres per hour. Cats, 100 kilometres per hour. So they actually hit the concrete a lot slower than what we would. Now, um, there was a study done, I think it was back in the 1960s, about all the, the cats that were taken in New York to a, a vet, to this, this hospital, about cats that had jumped out of high-rise buildings. So in this one, which one do you think would probably jump? Um, uh, um, yeah, probably that one that looks a bit crazy in the middle. Okay, now, the, this is a bit pixelated, but on here, this is um, zero, it goes up to 100%. So if we're um, humans and we're, we're really upset and we decide to jump off a building, um, if we jump from, oh, what is it? Uh, probably around six stories, you can see the chance of, your, of you dying, not, which isn't too good, is about 90%. Um, anywhere above nine stories, then, um, then you, you don't have a happy ending. Um, cats, though, a cat, if a cat falls from uh, three stories, then the chance of it actually being killed is about 10%. And what is amazing is for cats, um, anything about, above four stories increases their chance of survival. Because what they do is, as they're falling down, um, they, they start to relax and they spread out. So when they actually do finally hit the ground, they're nice and relaxed. And, um, and they go, kabloop. And they don't die. Okay, but look, I was actually thinking, why would a cat actually jump out of a, out of a window anyway? Um, so, okay, yeah, okay, probably insects, or there might be some really weird people out there training cats to jump out of windows. Um, yeah, not so good. Um, or just mistreatment if you've been, you know, washing a cat. Um, but there are ramifications about this, can I just tell you, in New York at the moment, the cats are actually taking revenge. Um, <laughs> and, the, and some cats actually are afraid of other cats falling on top of them, so they've got to have helmets. And, um, and of course, you know, you're going to be neurotic you know, as a cat if you're going to have... And you know, alcohol and substance abuse as well. OK. OK. Um, typewriter keyboard. Um, do you guys remember typewriters? You do? Oh, cool. Um, what is the biggest word? I will just tell you, um, if you get this right, you can buy me a beer, okay? Um, <laughs> that's at your price. Um, what's the biggest word that you can make using the top row of a typewriter keyboard? And you can jumble the letters around. You can repeat them as many times as you want. And the typewriter keyboard's the same. It's, a, it's QWERTY. It's the same as, the, as your, your computer. Okay, anybody know? Okay, if you, you don't have to buy me a drink, okay? So, um, anybody want to guess? Yes, well done. Can we give her a round of applause, okay? Um, the biggest word, I think, is actually tito totara, but, um, but typewriter, because when they, um, they invented the typewriter, the, um, this was a super old style typewriter, but... Um, so they could actually sell it. They would actually have the salespeople going into, a, into an office and normally they would employ, being really sexist, um, young girls to do all of the, the handwriting for invoices. And without saying anything, they put a piece of paper in, hit the carriage return, and we still talk about carriage returns when we talk about computers. I'm um, going to the next line. Um, hit the A key, that's why it's right over on the left-hand side and really an awful place to be because if you were typing... It gets really, really sore on your, your pinky. Um, and then typewriter on the top row so they could find the, the actual letters. And you think, that's, that's not fast, is it? Um, but the, the whole design was because they had these keys that would hit up. And if you were too fast, then the keys would actually hit on the way back. Um, but we're stuck with it as far as technology. Okay. Nobody gets killed in this video. There are two people. 
stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he could fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. I, I still like that. The, um, but when you think about it with technology, how often do we get stuck with technology and it doesn't work? And then we think, oh, what are we going to do? Um, um, this is me showing my age. If I say the word Commodore 64 to my students, they think I'm talking about a car. Okay? Um, put up your hand if you had a Commodore 64. Oh, that's good. Oh. Yeah, you can actually sit at the front. This is where seniors get to sit. Okay? Um, oh. That is so cool. Um, Look, I actually didn't. I actually had a Commodore 128, okay. Um, but you know, 64 had 64k of memory, and it had the floppy disk, 700k, and I actually had this little gizmo that was like a um, a hole punch, so I could actually cut into the edge, so I could have it double sided, and get an extra 700k memory out of it. But you think about it, 700k. If you take a photo, um, just with your your phone, that's probably going to be about six meg, okay? That's the equivalent of probably like nine floppy disks just for one photo, okay? Um, now, um, and also I, I had the, the, the actual external floppy disk drive there. But when I was at, sco at school, in primary school, I had the chance to, well, to I went to Punchbowl Boys High School and a friend of mine actually had the chance to either go to Billmore or Punchbowl. And he said he wanted to go to Punchbowl because Punchbowl had two computers. And they didn't have disk drives back then. It was with the punch cards. Do people remember those? Ah, oh, cool. Okay. Um, but we had one kid in the, who was in year 11 or year 12 at the time who was a guru because he could actually get this computer to actually tell the time. And it had 16, 16 numbers along the top. And he was, he was absolutely amazing. But I, I look at, this is my grandson. Um, he's four months old, so you can go, oh. Um, William, I mean, when I talk about my old technology, if you ask your kids about their old technology, they're going to talk about the iPhone 5 or the iPhone 6. Now, um, William, the chances are when he gets up to be about 16, he won't even use a phone. It'll probably be like a watch or something, and he'll just maybe tap his ear and say, phone home, and, and it'll just do it. Um, I mean, that technology is available now, but you know, think how much things will improve in 16 years. And phones. Um, put up your hand if you're in a school that bans phones. Okay, there's, there's a few. Um, my school um, doesn't. We used to, and um, my staff used to ask me, can I just go around and, and check on classrooms as the head teacher? And, and I'll do it. Every time I'd walk into a classroom, see, so keep the phone out, I'll take it. And I was really clever because what I'd do is I would have my phone and I'd borrow the, the lab assistant's phone and somebody else's phone, so I'd, I've got a stack of phones. And then I'd walk into a classroom, and if I was just to take one phone off one kid, then that kid's going to jump up and down. But if I've got three or four already, they know huh, he's not going to give in. So I would have a whole stack of phones. And it got to the point where I was thinking, I've got, a thousand, I've got thousands of dollars worth of phones here, um, and it was just too much. I thought, I don't want to be really responsible for this. 
But what we do now is we accept phones to be in the class as long as they're not you know, using it for, for listening to music whilst we're in class or for texting. But they have their phones out. If we go off to the library, it's easy for me to actually put up a slide with questions that I need students to research or just write on the board. And the kids go up, click, take a photo, and they've got it. So um, and that, that's a, just a terrific use of technology. And if I talk about a story, um, kids will actually tell you, you know, the, the actual dates for when things happen because they're, they're actually checking it as you're talking. Okay, um, so this um, used to be, um, this is actually old now because it used to be this old idea of, you know, students need to be um, you know, needed, you know, all this you know, stuff, you know, food, and then, you, then it changed to Wi-Fi. But I was at a Google conference, and it's actually changed. And you guys have probably picked it up now. Okay, <laughs> um, um, Samuel Morse. Um, when we talk about Morse code, um, back in his day, you could only send one message at a time. So your message that you'd send through the telegraph had to be super, super short. And he invented a really boring job, must have been. That, that guy actually looks like my brother. But, um, but Morse code was... Um, the dots and the dashes were dots and dashes on a piece of paper that was pulled through the machine. Um, but um, this one, um, SOS, okay? Um, if you're at home and you want to watch the Brady Bunch and you're in the kitchen having a, making a cup of coffee, you know the Brady Bunch is about to start because you hear the, the theme tune. The same thing like if you're on a ship and you're not going to be listening to what's going on Right, you know, everybody else's conversations that you're hearing. But if you hear the dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 then you actually think, oh, somebody's in trouble, and then you go and actually listen to the message. But I thought I would actually do a test. And I, I saw this photo um, in one of the workshops this afternoon. Um, and, but I went to uh, my daughter's books, um, Chamber of Secrets, randomly picked page 149, and because I'm a science teacher, and you guys have probably done this as well, have you? Um, gone through and, and thought, I wonder if Morse code was actually true, was the way which he actually set it up. So I, I went through and I did a, a, a tally, and um, this is really good. Can you read it from the back? No? Please say no. Um, this is a really good exercise because it shows how bad stuff is if it's in a table form. Because if you look there, you'll probably strain your eyes. If you actually um, put it as a, as a graph, it's a lot clearer. And you'll see the most common letter uh, is E followed by T. So we would expect the E um, as a dot followed by T as a dash. Yep. So that works. And you can actually get students to do that. And if you get a whole class to do it for one page each, which doesn't take that long, put it onto an Excel spreadsheet, then you've got thousands of, of letters that you can, or thousands of occurrences that you can go through. Okay. Um, Immunisation. Um, I was reading in the newspaper, either Victoria or South Australia has just had an outbreak of measles. Um, was it, which was Victoria? Yep. Um, so... You're safe here. Don't go back to Victoria. Okay, this is the place to be. Um, but it's amazing that what we actually accepted as a childhood disease of measles, we've got the chance to actually get rid of it. Um, and the, the same thing for polio. But it really came about because of a cow. Um, and Edward Jenner... Um, oh, warning, this is a really... I'm going to show you a photo of someone that's got smallpox... And it is an awful photo, but I thought I'd just leave it there. Um, so it'll be up there for about one second. So if you don't like an awful photo, please don't look. Okay. All right. Pretty nasty, wasn't it? Um, if you had smallpox, the chances are you'd die, and it wouldn't be a, a nice way to actually die. Um, Edward Jenner, um, he was actually in, involved in medicine, and um, but he was talking to a milkmaid who said that when smallpox was coming around, that she wasn't going to get infected by smallpox because she had had cowpox. So Edward Jenner thought, OK, I'll actually find that out. It's 1890s. Um, so he went to um, his gardener, uh, 
his name was James Phipps, of all places, um, and borrowed his son. Got him, had, and his son had been infected previously with cowpox, infected him with smallpox, he survived. And he thought, hey, this must be true. So then he actually did it to nine other kids in the village, and they all survived. But you've got to think, what if, what if they didn't? Um, but um, he's looked upon as being really, really super because he's the, the king of vaccinations. Um, measles, um, everybody you know, that's our age would have accepted that when you were young that you got measles. Okay, it was accepted. In fact, if you were a girl and you, your parents knew of one of your friends that had measles, then you would actually have to go over there and have a sleepover. Be, so, so that you get measles because you don't want to have measles when you're, you're pregnant because it's not really nice for the, the unborn child. Um, but that was really accepted. Um, however, this guy, um, if you, you think you know, some people are really bad, but Andrew Wakefield, um, 1988, 1998, um, he was actually selling a vaccination for measles and... Um, that's when the triple vaccine came on, on board. And he wrote this one paper that actually, um, that he said linked the triple vaccine to autism. And, I mean, that was found out to be a total fake, but it was peer-reviewed. Two people actually said, yep, the, his, his findings are, are correct. But that was you know, 18 years ago, and still we've got people... I mean, he was drummed out of, out of medicine, but we've still got people that actually believe that there's this conspiracy about vaccinations. And, um, and nothing's... Well, I mean, apart from that, but I think how many people have actually died from measles that it could have been prevented? OK. Um, oh, polio. Um, at the moment... Um, Rotary, is anybody involved with the Rotary Club, Rotary Clubs? Um, Rotary is, is tremendous because it's going to get rid of polio. Um, at the moment, um, well, which is, what is depressing is last year there was actually more people um, killed trying to treat polio than what actually died from polio because of the, the places where it is. So it's very sort of war-torn countries. But polio is an awful disease and we used to accept it, that people get it. I mean, you'd have hospitals with you know, hundreds of these artificial lungs where people would sleep so they could, they could breathe for the night. I mean, this is actually 1988. Okay, actually here's 1988. That's the, the countries that actually had polio um, down to 2014. So it's getting, getting nice and small. Okay, um, I spoke about dihydrogen monoxide. Um, I've, oh, actually we've got a little bit of time there. Um, dihydrogen monoxide is really bad. Um, it is the major component of acid rain. Um, someone was telling me that's in every cancer cell. They've found it. Um, Silver Water Prison in Sydney, they actually feed it to the inmates. Um, and it's, you know, there's so many things that you can... If you just do a Google search on DH. MO, um, you'll even see there's a chemical um, safety sheet on it, um, on how bad it is. Um, but um, one of the things I should just tell you, um, if you do come in contact, um, I shall let you read it. Um, that's amazing. I actually tried to do this with the Department of Education, but I got in a lot of trouble last year. Um, because I, I found it in one of our science labs and, and sent an email to everybody on our, our network. And, um, and the, um, my principal was telling me that if any principal had read the email and didn't know that dihydrogen monoxide was water, then it would actually lead to an increased level of stress and um, extra workload. So um, I got in a lot of trouble. Ah. Oh, um, I, I, actually, I was actually thinking a little bit stronger words, but, um, okay. Um, okay. Um, one of the things that I've 
I've been working on is a, is a program called iSTEM. We all know what STEM is. Um, the I was because um, anything that's interesting has to have an I in front of it. Um, so, we, um, so we did that. So, um, so we came up with iSTEM. Um, and it was actually because we, we were running a, a program of taking the kids to space camp. Um, and this was six years ago when we started. We had hundreds of kids from the, the Met Southwest of Sydney that wanted to go but couldn't afford it. And we were running all of these um, extra activities for these kids that were going on space camp. And then we thought, why not just open it up to any kid? So on weekends, um, we, if there's something going on in Sydney that's scientific for kids, we put it on our website and, and the kids, it's like a mob, they just turn up from all different schools. And, um, and, and go to the activities. So if you're in New South Wales, in, around Sydney, I don't know how many people are, or if you know people there, um, www.istem.com.au um, gives you all the details. Um, so it's, it's really good when people from NASA come out and they want to actually talk to us, or talk to, to students, then we're there because we can actually supply groups of students from all different schools. Now, um, this year, our Space Academy trip, um, we've actually got 52 teachers and students going in September. Um, but if you're interested, if you've got a few kids um, that are you know, just a handful from your school and it's not worthwhile you organising a big trip, then um, you can actually just join us. Um, for teachers, um, it's worth 60 hours of accredited training with, um, with BOSTES, um, September school holidays, um, we, we actually go to Korea, That's, that, was, that, that was me, um, three days in South Korea. Um, we do lots of cultural type things, go to a university, go to Samsung, then fly off to um, LA, baseball game, um, all of the uh, two theme parks, California Science Centre. Um, then we fly down to San Diego, so we go to the USS Midway, Midway um, SeaWorld, uh, the Environmental Centre, and then we fly off and we do uh, six days in Huntsville at the Space Academy. And the students go off, they do the advanced course, which is really good because they get to do all the scuba diving and, and lots of good fun, lots of activity. Um, no one's been killed, it does look a bit dangerous sometimes. Um, and the teachers, um, we do the adult course. Um, so it's so we get to get, do all those good things, um, plus a few extra things that are a little bit more scary. Okay. Oh, I'm stuck on the slideshow. Let's go. Okay. And after I should have said after um, space camp, we go to San Francisco and um, do the exploratorium and, and cable cars and, and be tourists. So um, if you'd like some more information, that's the website to go to. If you'd like um, any information for me, that's my um, email. And that's it. We've, we're finished. And I'm sorry, but we're four minutes early um, for drinks. Um, okay. Uh, can we all thank Ken for the, his awesome presentation? There's lots of stuff that I know I'm going to take away from that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I thank you for laughing at the jokes, even though you knew what was going to be on? And, um, and um, yeah, thank you. And, and nobody has to buy me a drink because the drinks are free this afternoon, which is good. <laughs>